Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, meetup for Our Ladies Harborori. I'm Simisan Indaba, the founder and co-organizer of Our Ladies Harborori. And today we have Dr. Nicola Rene, an experienced uh, data scientist, and she'll be showing us and teaching us how to start our own data science portfolio. So I'm not going to take up much time, Nicola. You can continue. And um, after the presentation, depending on how she wants to do it, we'll have uh, questions and some comments, suggestions. And then after the recording, we'll get into the announcements. So, Nicola, you can go ahead. All right. Um, thank you uh, very much for the introduction um, and thank you for the, the invitation to talk uh, today. Um, I'm happy to take sort of questions throughout um, or at the end, kind of up to you. Um, what I'm kind of going to be talking about today is how do you build uh, a data science portfolio um, and some of the things you might want to include in it. Um, and hopefully if we have time in the second half, we'll do uh, some live coding um, and create an example of a portfolio using some Tidy Tuesday data. Um, but first, let me sort of tell you a little bit about me um, and what I do. So I'm currently a data scientist at Jumping Rivers, where I do various things, uh, mostly using R. Um, so including statistical consultancy, uh, building shiny apps, um, and we also run training courses in R. So I do a lot of teaching uh, R to other people. Uh, my background is in academia, uh, specifically in statistics, um, and that's where I first started using R about eight or so years ago. And Tidy Tuesday was the way that I started building a por por portfolio, initially just to get more comfortable working in R um, and using different types of data to what I normally worked with. Um, and then I started sort of using that to support things like job applications when I was going uh, from academia to working in consultancy. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to use as an example uh, today. So let's start talking about data science portfolios. Uh, first of all, why, why would you want to make a data science portfolio? Um, I'm hoping that since you're here, uh, most of you already think that making a data science portfolio is a good idea. Um, but in case you need a little bit more convincing, um, there's a couple of reasons why I think data science portfolios are a good thing to have. First of all, it's useful for job applications. Most jobs ask you to submit a CV, and usually there may be one or two pages, and it's impossible to condense everything you can do as a human being into one page. And so portfolios allow you to sort of showcase a wider range of things um, and actually show potential employers uh, what you can do. And personal projects can also be used as evidence of skills you've developed in sort of confidential projects. So let's say you write on your CV that you're really good at fitting machine learning models because you worked on a work project that did that. If that work project is confidential, then you personally don't have anything to show for it. Um, but if you have a personal project where you've fitted some machine learning models to say some Tidy Tuesday data, then you have evidence to prove that you can do that. And portfolios are also an opportunity to showcase projects that you enjoy. It's easy to fall into the trap thinking that, oh, this is a skill that employers are looking for, so I'll do a project that showcases that I have these skills. I'm not saying there's anything overly wrong with that approach, um, but I think if you do projects that you're excited about, I think, first of all, it shows through in your work. Um, and it also means that if employers are looking at your portfolio, you're more likely to end up with a job doing projects that you enjoy. Um, and I think that's especially true if you want to change career direction or if you want to work on something different or if you're kind of just starting out after graduating. Um, it's nice to be able to define these are the types of projects I want to work on. And finally, it's nice just to have a portfolio for your own reference. So when you have to write a CV or when you're preparing for an interview um, or even when you're working on a project and you think, oh, I've done something similar to this before. If you've written down a bunch of stuff about the projects you've worked on, 
is much easier to prepare and to find information about your own work. So now that I've convinced you that uh, building a data science portfolio is something you might want to do, um, well, the next question is, well, what should, what should you put in there? Um, and I will start with the classic answer of it depends. Okay? It depends what type, what area of data science um, you're working in, what types of projects you want to work on. There's a wide variety of things that you could put in a data science portfolio. What I generally recommend is that you have sort of three to five projects that are completed and you highlight those. Again, ideally on projects you enjoyed working on. If you're just starting out, it's absolutely fine to have less than that. But if you have more than five projects, it can be hard for the person looking at your portfolio to decide what projects to look at. And they're probably not going to look through everything. So think about what projects are most important to you for you to show someone else. Um, and this is something I really struggle with because you sort of want to say, but I can do all of these cool things and I want to show you that I can do all of these cool things. But I also know that in terms of user experience, that can be overwhelming. So you sort of have to pick uh, your favorites. And then within each sort of project that you highlight, I think it's also really useful to show the process. You can show what a project looked like when it was a work in progress. Um, so say if you're building a Shiny app um, and it's all beautifully styled and matches some uh, sort of branding, also show what it looked like with just a default Shiny theme because it shows what you can do. Okay? The, the person looking at your portfolio might not be an expert in Shiny, and so they might not know how much effort it can take to make a shiny app that doesn't look like a shiny app. Okay. My third sort of recommendation, which sort of goes along with the, the idea of showing the process, is that ideally you show both the code um, and the outputs um, where possible, where you're allowed to share your code. Um, if the person looking at your portfolio is maybe uh, a non-technical manager, they might not care about or understand your code. What they care about is the nice data visualization at the end or the model that gives accurate forecasts. Whereas if the person looking at your portfolio is a technical manager who might want to hire you for a job, they're more likely to want to see how you did what you did. So thinking about things like, does your code follow good coding practices, for example? Okay, so now you've decided to build a portfolio and you've theoretically decided what to put in it. The next thing you need to think about is where where do you keep all this stuff? Um, the easiest place I think to keep portfolios is on GitHub or GitLab. Um, you can create a GitHub repository for each project and you can use the readme file uh, in that repository to write some text it gives some explanation of the project, maybe include some images or links to uh, shiny apps, for example. If you want to go one step further, you could build a website. Uh, there are a multitude of ways to build a website. Um, and there's a few different ways you can build websites from within R. If you don't have a portfolio website already, and you work mostly in R, uh, Python or Julia, I'd really recommend looking at Quarto as a way to build a website. Uh, you can also use Hugo. Uh, there's the Hugo down and blog down packages that can help you build a Hugo website from R. Um, and that is what I use because I uh, unfortunately built my website before Quarto was a thing. I think if I, if I was to do it over, I'd probably pick Quarto. And there's lots of free places to host static portfolio websites. You don't necessarily need to pay for anything. Uh, so GitHub Pages, if you keep code for your website on GitHub, you can deploy your website straight to a GitHub Pages site. Um, and that also means that your website itself becomes a portfolio project. If you have the, the code hosted, not only can you, you know, do some modeling or uh, build data visualizations, it's, oh, you can also build some websites and here's the proof and here's the website. Uh, there's also Quarto Pub, if you build your website with Quarto, or Netlify, which is a bit more uh, general, not necessarily just our uh, websites, um, but it works very well. And Netlify is uh, what I use. 
So how do you build one of these data science projects that you want to show in your portfolio? How do you get started with that very first project? The very short answer is you get some data, you do something to it, and then you write about it. What particular thing you do to that data will depend on you. It depends on what you're interested in. It might be data wrangling and maybe processing some text data. It could be data visualization, so making plots or shiny apps. It could be automated reporting with R Markdown or Quarto, or it could be fitting models and generating forecasts. Pick something you like. Um, ideally, pick a data set that's related to something uh, you're interested in. A lot of my projects tend to sit within data visualization uh, because that's what I'm interested in. Um, I like kind of figuring out how to communicate uh, data to, to people, particularly sort of non-technical people. Um, so that's what a lot of my projects tend to focus on. And I would also say don't underestimate the importance of the writing about it part. This is kind of where you show how you communicate results of projects. And that's something that's really important, regardless of what job or what sector or what sort of, what sort of technical work uh, you do. You need to be able to explain uh, what you did um, and ideally explain it to, in a sort of non-technical way so that anyone can understand it. So in order to, to build one of these sort of data science projects or portfolio pieces, uh, you usually need to find data. Um, you might already have some data of your own that you have an idea for a project. If so, that's great. Um, if not, there's lots of places to find data. So if you're looking for publicly available data, there's a GitHub repository that lists lots of public data sets by topic. There's also Tidy Tuesday, um, which I'll be talking about uh, a little bit more in a second. And personally, I've also made use of the 30 day chart challenge uh, slash 30 day map challenge, um, as well as the Dubois challenge. Um, these are all sort of more data visualization uh, related, but they're still a useful place to sort of find uh, resources or to get ideas on what you might want to do. So a little bit more information on Tidy Tuesday, if you're not familiar with it. It's a weekly data project uh, aimed at the R community, although other other programming languages are welcome. Um, so a new data set is released every week through a GitHub repository. And the idea is that people use R to visualize or model the data and share what they did, including sharing code. And I think this is really nice because you can see how other people differently interpreted the same data set. And if you see someone who's done something similar to you, um, because they've shared their code, you might see that they've done it in a different way. So you can learn new things from other people, even if you have the same uh, ideas. And the data sets themselves are very much real data. Um, they're not the sort of toy data sets you sometimes find in sort of textbooks or tutorials. Um, there's usually some minimal data cleaning done for you. Um, so it is data that you can read into R straight away, um, which means it's a really nice resource for, for finding data. Um, and I use it quite a lot if I'm looking for examples of data for uh, for teaching, for example. So most of what I'm talking about today is based on uh, personal experience. And some of it is more of this is how I wish I'd done it rather than this is what I have done. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about how I built my portfolio um, before we go on to building an example. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, I started with Tidy Tuesday. Um, I had to sort of dig this example out of the archives, but this was the first Tidy Tuesday plot uh, that I ever made. And I didn't go into Tidy Tuesday with the idea of building a portfolio from it. For me, it was more a way of learning R. Um, I mostly worked with base R and Python up to that point, And then it was suddenly like, oh, there's this thing called the Tidyverse, and it seems like something I should learn. But I was sort of two years into an existing project, and I didn't want to convert all of my code to Tidyverse. So I wanted another project where I could learn that. And that's 
that's kind of why I did Tidy Tuesday. Um, and I still do Tidy Tuesday most weeks, um, even though by now I'm very comfortable with, with R and the Tidyverse. Um, I maybe do it with a slightly different mindset. I think now I have more specific things I want to learn. Uh, so I have a little list um, of types of data visualizations I want to figure out how to make, uh, R packages and functions that I want to learn how to use. Um, or if there's been sort of an update to a tidyverse package, is a nice opportunity to see what the changes are. I think for me, Tidy Tuesday is essentially a way to learn new things in a sort of risk-free and pressure-free um, environment. And when I started doing Tidy Tuesday, I think that's also probably when I sort of started pushing my code to GitHub uh, regularly. Um, which again, wasn't something I could do with all of my research work um, because of sort of data privacy uh, reasons. And this also means that it was a nice place to practice using Git and GitHub, which again, is a very useful skill to have as a data scientist and something that's kind of hard to show um, in terms of portfolios. So just getting familiar with Git is really useful. And I think having some practice of working with Git on your own is also useful before having to sort of dive straight into learning how to use Git and having to learn how to collaborate through Git at the same time, um, because that can get complicated uh, quite quickly. I also started posting my Tidy Tuesday stuff on Twitter, uh, back before Twitter was as it is now. Um, and I actually think this was one of the most useful things for me um, because other people post Tidy Tuesday and R related things on Twitter. And very quickly, it feels like you're part of this R community. And it's another way in addition to a portfolio of sharing your work with other people. And I've definitely had opportunities that come my way because people have seen my work on Twitter and then wanted to talk about it. And eventually that became a website uh, to show my portfolio. Um, and part of that website also became a blog. Um, so to just kind of briefly talk about blogs versus portfolios. Um, to me, portfolios are sort of finished, polished projects, uh, whereas blogs can be a bit more sort of informal work in progress, shorter projects, um, or just sort of showcasing something that you're currently interested in or uh, working on. So let's move on uh, to actually making something for your portfolio and using some Tidy Tuesday data. If you've never done Tidy Tuesday before, uh, the thing I'd recommend doing is setting up a GitHub repository um, or making an account if you don't have one. Okay, so you want to create a brand new GitHub repository just to keep all your Tidy Tuesday uh, stuff in. And generally what you want to do is give it a sensible name so Tidy Tuesday, for example, and fill out the rest of the details on that uh, new repository page. So make sure you set it to be a public repository if you want to use it as a portfolio piece um, and share your codes. And there's an option to there to add um, a readme file, which I'd, I'd always recommend doing. Um, you can add a readme file manually, at least if you forget, uh, don't worry too much about it. But that readme file is where you can add some text and some description about your work. Um, and this is our first thing that people see when they go into a GitHub repository that you've created. And then we need to get that Git repository onto uh, your local machine. You can do that using terminal commands if you're already comfortable with Git, uh, but if not, you can use the sort of click and drag process in our studio. So you go to sort of file, a new project, and then choose create a project from version control and uh, select the Git repository option. Um, if you've never used Git within RStudio before, um, it can sometimes seem a little bit tricky to set up. Um, and I've definitely run into uh, problems before. What I'd really recommend is this uh, website here. Um, so that's uh, Jenny Bryan's Happy Git with R website. It covers most of the things that you might get stuck with. Um, it's a really uh, good resource for using Git with R. Um, I highly, highly recommend that. Okay, so now uh, let's go through a tidy Tuesday example uh, so you can sort of see 
what goes through my brain when I'm sitting down to do a tidy Tuesday. Um, so we need to create a file um, to write some code. It could be a .r file, um, a sort of rmd file if you want to use R markdown, or a quarto file. Um, it's very much up to you uh, how you do it. Uh, I'm going to go with quarto, um, mainly because quarto is reasonably new and shiny, and I like it. Um, so we can create a new quarto file. Um, we're just with the extension .qmd. And the first thing I'm going to do is read in some data. Now, if I uh, go back here for a second. Within the Tidy Tuesday uh, repository on GitHub, for each week, um, there's some information about where the data came from. And there's really helpfully, um, someone has already sort of pre written the code for you to read the data into R. So the easiest way to get your data into R is to copy and paste from here. Um, you can there's a tidy choose the R package, um, which sort of stores the data uh, for each week. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a code chunk and then just paste that in. Okay, so if I run this, it takes a little second because sometimes the data sets are uh, quite big, but you can see okay, we have a data set here. Okay, um, so this is a data set from uh, last. Uh, which is looking at sort of um, stock prices for different tech companies uh, over time. Um, and the first thing I do with Tidy Tuesday, or any sort of new data set I'm looking at in general, is look at the data. Uh, look at the column names. Okay, so you can kind of see it from the preview because it's a, a reasonably small data set. But you can see here uh, we have our eight uh, possible different variables. I also recommend uh, looking at the data dictionary that comes in the Tidy Tuesday repository. Um, so there's our two data sets for this week. And you can see here, okay, these are all the column names, and this is a description of what each of those columns are. Um, sometimes column names and data sets are abbreviated, um, and it's not always clear what a column actually relates to. Um, and these data dictionaries are a really nice place to sort of look that up. It can also help with things like identifying what units a column is recorded in. Um, if you've done some analysis and then you get some really odd results, it's useful to sort of head back to the data dictionary and figure out if it if it that variable is what you think about uh, is what you think it is. And at this point, I need to start thinking about what I want to get out of Tidy Tuesday this week. Um, what things do I want to sort of check off um, of my list of visualizations or packages I want to learn? Um, and kind of start thinking about an approach uh, to tackling this data. Then. So what aspects of the data uh, do you want to show? So for this example, um, I come from a sort of time series analysis background. Uh, so I'm going to look at how values change uh, over time. And I'm also going to think about how the different uh, companies in the data set compare. I also want to think about what do I want to get out of this in terms of technical things I want to learn. Uh, so for this one, uh, I wanted to learn how to use the GEG Sankey package uh, to make uh, bump charts. Because it's a package, I think is very cool. And I've seen some very nice graphics made with it. Um, but I haven't had the chance to use it very much. I also wanted to work on using uh, sort of font awesome icons within text uh, in the plot. So let's do um, a little bit of, of data wrangling first. Okay. Um, so let's add another uh, sort of code chunk to, uh, first of all, load in some packages. So uh, I'm just going to load in the entire uh, tidyverse uh, package. I think it's fine to load in uh, the whole thing when you're doing this sort of interactive uh, work. If you're building something like an R package, it's, it's useful to call individual packages. But here, I think we're fine. And I'm going to take uh, my uh, data set. 
and I'm going to look at sort of changes uh, per year. So the data is currently um, recorded every weekday. I'm going to sort of aggregate that by year. So we can do that using uh, dpyr. So let's create a variable called year um, and use the year function from Luberdate. And then I want to sort of calculate the average um, stock price per per company per year. So do a little bit of group by uh, stock symbol and year. Okay, and then we use the summarize function there to create our uh, average opening stock price. There were some NA values in the data uh, as well, so I'm going to ignore that. Here, um, we also have the, uh, when I looked into the data a little bit more, um, some of the data was very recent, up to 2023, um, and some of the data was not quite as up to date, so it only gone up to 2022. Um, so I'm going to say, let's only use data that's uh, up to 2022, so that I have every every company recorded over the same period of time. Okay. And I'm going to save that as an object uh, called plot data. Okay. So okay. if we look at our data, okay. you can see now that I have a sort of smaller data set with a uh, company name, uh, year, and just a single uh, opening, average opening stock price. So now uh, I can make another uh, code chunk and we can do some exploratory plots. Okay, so I'm not going to jump straight into let's make the, the fancy plot that I want to. It's usually useful to start with the kind of basic plots. So I think you can never really go wrong with things like scatter plots, line charts, and bar charts um, as a starting point for looking at your data. So let's uh, make a bar chart of uh, sort of average stock price over time. Uh, so I'm using, I tend to use ggplot2 for most of my data visualizations uh, because I think they're they're very easy to sort of customize. Okay. Okay. Um, all of this code that um, I'm writing should be shared in the slides as well, and I'll share the codes on GitHub as well. Um, so you can see that this makes a kind of uh, nice little simple bar chart. It gives us a bit of an idea of what's going on uh, over time. The other thing I said I wanted to um, think about was how are those changes happening for uh, the different companies in the data set? So I could, for example, color uh, the bars by different companies. And I get my sort of colored uh, stacked bar chart. Um, now, personally, I find these sort of stacked bar charts, especially when there's quite as many different colors as this, really difficult to read. Right? I don't think I've gotten any more information from this bar chart than I had from the previous one. And so at this point, I might start thinking, well, actually, bar chart is probably not the best way to go. Instead, let's do a sort of line chart. Okay, so change G on call, G on line, and color by lines instead. And this is starting to look um, a little bit more sensible. It looks kind of uh, like your more traditional time series plot. It's easier to see uh, what's going on. And at this point, I kind of want to start thinking, OK, I know roughly what relationships in the data I'm going to show. Now I need to decide on a way to actually communicate that. And this is where I'm going to start using that GG Sankey package um, that I wanted to try to see if it works. So let's load in the GG Sankey package and create that plot. Okay. Uh, so let's put my aesthetics in here. So we have uh, year along the x-axis still. Um, the thing about the GG Sankey package, uh, which is a little bit weird, is that it has some uh, 
additional sort of special aesthetics. So it doesn't just take X and Y values, it specifically wants uh, X value and node, um, which still confuses me ever so slightly. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to color uh, by company as well. And this creates this sort of default uh, comp chart uh, from the GG Psyche package. Um, one thing that I don't 100% understand is that I get a bunch of warning messages, but my plot looks uh, how I'd like it to look, so I'm going to ignore that. Um, and I think when I usually get to this point with Tidy Tuesday is at the moment this still very much looks like a GG plot chart. It has a sort of default colour scheme, uh, that sort of default grey background, and you look at it and you think, okay, it's a, it's a chart that sort of does communicate the data reasonably well, but it still looks like an R plot. Um, and this is where the sort of styling your plots comes in. And I think this is, when you start styling your plots, these are the kind of things you start putting in portfolios, because what sort of managers or employers like is sort of often quite like branded plots, um, things with sort of consistency of styling. So we can start to sort of refine uh, this plot a little bit more. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, we can set uh, the color to be uh, transparent, so I don't have an outline uh, between the different uh, sort of bump charts there. Um, I also want to make it uh, sort of semi-transparent as well. Okay. okay, so I get a slightly um, more refined plot. And then we can start thinking about colors um, and themes. So one thing when it comes to colors, if my recommendation is that you should never have more than eight colors. Okay? When you start using more than eight colors, uh, your plots become a lot less accessible okay, in terms of uh, people with color blindness uh, generally can't, there's generally not enough distinct colors there. Um, and we have, I think, uh, something like 14 different colors here in this uh, rainbow chart, um, and it's quite difficult to tell them apart. So you might also want to think about, well, what sort of message do you want to get across from your plot? When someone looks at your plot, there should be a point to it. There's something they should sort of uh, take home. Okay. So I don't actually care about all of these different companies. What I might want to do is just highlight one of them. So I might want to highlight uh, the, the one that's currently uh, ranked first. So instead of colouring by every company, uh, what you can do is say colour them if the stock symbol is equal to ADBE. Uh, And suddenly I kind of have this highlighting thing going on. Okay, I'm specifically highlighting this one here. And I can change the colors in my chart using the scale fill functions. Okay? So this is where you might want to start thinking about brandings and different colors. Okay? So let's say gray um, and red. Okay? And you kind of picked here, kind of picked sort of neutral background color. Um, for all of the uh, companies I'm not that interested in and highlighted specifically in red, uh, the one we are interested in. One package uh, that I do want to highlight here is this eyedropper package. Um, so essentially this package lets you um, input an image and then it will return all of the different colors that it finds in that image. Um, so this is a really nice way if you are trying to um, either match your colors to your, the sort of data set, a particular topic, um, or if you want to extract colors uh, from logos or things like that to match uh, your plots to those. Uh, it's a really useful uh, package there. Okay. And we can start um, adjusting themes and things as well. Okay, so I always think that theme minimal should be the default uh, theme because I think it looks a lot uh, cleaner. 
Um, and what I'd also do at this point is uh, start adding in some text. Okay, so as much as I like R and data visualization and working with numbers and doing analysis, people like text, they like explanations. So adding things like titles um, and subtitles um, is really, really useful. Um, and you can do that with the, the labs function um, in ggplot2. Um, I am aware of the time, so what I'm going to do is rather than sort of type out uh, all of this code, I'm going to run through it in the slides um, instead. Okay, so I think we got to about this point. Um, okay, so you can add uh, text uh, uh, with sort of titles and subtitles. Uh, one thing that I found really useful when doing Tidy Tuesday is sort of separating out the text um, and saving them as variables. I think it makes my, co my code a lot neater and actually encourages me to write text properly um, when I'm not sort of trying to write it inside an argument, something else. Uh, the string wrap function um, is really useful. If you've ever worked with sort of long subtitles or anything in R before, um, you'll notice that by default they sort of run off the end of the page. Uh, string wrap lets you um, say how many characters should be in a line and then automatically wraps the rest of your text. Um, so that's really useful for, again, making your plots more readable. Okay. And then you can start thinking a little bit more about themes. Okay, this I think the theme functions in ggplot2 are a really useful thing to get familiar with um, because you can kind of transform your plots almost so that they don't look like R plots. Okay. As much as I love R, I think one of the biggest compliments you get about plots is well, it doesn't look like you could have made that in R. Um, and the theme functions in ggplot2 are a sort of really good way to, to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and then there was a, a few more steps involved, I will admit. Um, but this is sort of the end result um, from the Tidy Tuesday plot I created uh, that particular week. So the extra couple of steps there. Um, I used the show text package um, for adding in uh, Google fonts. Um, and the little icons you saw as well. Um, there are other packages for working with fonts in R, um, but I found the show text package uh, works really well. Uh, the other R package uh, for working with uh, ggplot2 is a ggtext package. Um, and this, I think, is one of my favorite sort of add on uh, packages. So, what it lets you do is uh, add sort of markdown text to things like subtitles or titles. So instead of using a legend that you see um, on the site, you can sort of make your legend within the text. Um, it also automatically aligns, uh, sort of wraps and aligns uh, your text as well to fit the space. And I think the last sort of adjustment I made to this plot was rather than using uh, the sort of standard grid lines, I added my own grid lines in uh, with sort of geon segment. So by default, these grid lines would have gone all the way up to the top. Um, but because this is a kind of symmetric plot, they're a little bit redundant if you uh, duplicate them. Uh, so adding them in just in the bottom half of the plot leaves you all this space here to actually add the text in. It sort of feels like it condenses and sort of tidies up your plot a little bit. Okay. The fuel code for that is up on GitHub as well, if you do want to have a little look at how I sort of went through the, the whole process of creating that that Tidy Tuesday visualization. So once you've made your, your Tidy Tuesday plot, um, or maybe you've fitted a, a model, for example, um, or sort of done some statistical analysis instead of data visualization, what you generally need to do next is share it with other people. So the first thing um, I'd recommend doing is pushing your code um, to GitHub. Hey, we've already gone through the, the process of setting up a GitHub repository um, and sort of linking that to our, our local machine. Again, you can use terminal commands if you're familiar with Git, but there's a sort of nice interface in uh, our studio. Okay, so if you're in here, uh, click on Git, you can see that my uh, .pmd file is here. So you can check, uh, tick the little checkboxes um, and that brings up sort of this interface here. And you can add a message to say what this particular git commit uh, contains. 
you should also publish uh, your work. Okay. When you created your Git repository, um, you could have created a, a README file. Um, so I think the README files are a nice opportunity to add a little bit of text um, explaining if you fitted the model, why did you pick that model? Um, you know, how, how well does it fit? Um, and what are the outputs? What are the things you've learned from fitting that data? Um, if you've gone uh, like I tend to do down the sort of data visualization uh, route, um, explain a little bit more about what your data visualization shows. Um, give some text. You can add images into the, the README file as well. Um, so when someone goes into your GitHub repository, um, you don't kind of want the first thing they see to be a list of files. You want them to look at your README file and see the images and immediately see the outputs that you've created um, from your portfolio project. If you've made, um, uh, sort of, if you've done it with R Markdown or with uh, Quarto, you could also publish that straight to GitHub Pages or Quarto Pub. So instead of it being sort of inside a, a, a read hub, uh, a readme inside a GitHub repository, it would sort of be on a website and someone could sort of scroll through your work. Um, and you can show your codes in that output as well. And like I said, the other place to share it is on Twitter. Um, it can sometimes feel a little bit scary posting that very first Tidy Tuesday post um, on Twitter, um, but the R community are a very friendly bunch, uh, so I do recommend that. Okay. Um, so what I'll do here is sort of publish it to Quarto so you can see um, the outputs as well. Okay. Um, so just to kind of uh, wrap up, um, I think that the key things that I'm trying to get across is that when you're building a data science portfolio, try to highlight projects you enjoy. Okay? It also means you'll enjoy building your data science portfolio um, rather than it seeming like a sort of a task or a chore. Um, and try to include text, textual descriptions of what you did so that other people besides you, um, particularly sort of non-technical people, are still able to understand your projects and sort of understand the motivations of, of why it's an important project. Um, and if you are right at the beginning of your uh, data science portfolio uh, journey, then I really do recommend Tidy Tuesday as being a sort of beginner friendly way to, to get started and get that first uh, project out there. Um, so yeah, I think I posted the link in uh, the chat already, uh, but the slides um, and the, the source code are up on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to access the slides or any of the code, um, you should be able to do that. But other than that, uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. I haven't looked at the chat. Thank you, Nicola, for that. There seems to be uh, some debate going on in the chat. Um, Yusuf, you were talking about <laughs> um, data visualization and how it tells a story. Could you tell us more about what you were saying? Uh, yes. Uh, the problem is with people that uh, so people often just display information to the visualization, uh, but we show what they try to explain about this data. This is the problem. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, you know, just sort of throwing a line chart at someone um, isn't super useful. Um, so trying to highlight what's the take home message. If someone spends 30 seconds looking at your plot, there should be a sort of almost like a sentence that forms in their head that says, okay, this is this is what I get from that plot. And it kind of... Yes, yes this is yeah. exactly what I mean. Yeah. And you can use sort of aspects of like highlighting particular elements of your chart to do that. Um, but yeah, text text is useful, sort of adding some explanation to your plot as well as just the plot itself is definitely useful. People learn about basic uh, knowledge about graphic design because with the, the principle of graphic design they can implement this uh, view through uh, data visualization yeah um definitely you know think learning not just sort of our specific 
data visualization, but thinking about graphic design and sort of how do you design anything well is definitely a useful skill to have if, if you want to get into data visualization. Yes, because graphic design is uh, explain the idea through visualization. Is this is the the, the same thing? Yeah. Uh, explain the data through the visualization. Oh, okay. Right, thanks for that, Yusuf. Um, I just have a question. Um, you call it, does your company or any other com tech company in the industry, do they recognize the IBM data science professional certificate? That seems to be the most popular data science certificate out there. Some people say that it's a minor course, it's a minor, minor qualification. So just how it, how, just how legit is it? Um. I mean, I think it's a, a legitimate way to learn new things and it can definitely be useful in terms of, you know, some a way to learn new things. Um, I don't necessarily think having any qualification is sort of a guarantee of a job or necessarily says you're definitely good at this. If you have, you know, if you have the work experience and you're able to show this is my range of skills, I think that can be just as useful as, you know, having done a qualification as well so it's useful and it's a nice way to to learn things but i don't think any qualification itself is essential for sort of getting into to data science as long as as long as you have the knowledge how you got that knowledge i don't necessarily think matters too much oh okay do we have any questions any comments yeah um nicole yeah how are you yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question about uh, data scientists and uh, data engineers. Um, the job description, like for a uh, data engineer, is for creating uh, ETL packages. And when you look at the like what a company requires from a data engineer, data scientist, they kind of overlap. So I'm wondering if, let's say, what you have ta taught us today, can it apply to a uh, data engineer who in the industry um i think so um so there's a, there's definitely a big overlap between sort of data scientists and and data engineers um so data scientists tend to do more of the sort of visualization and sort of modeling um side of things whereas as data engineers um help you with things like setting up databases or um deploy you know sort of deploying shiny apps uh, for example um but depending depending on what company you work for, there might be a very very big overlap between those two roles, and you might end up doing sort of a bit of everything. Um, if you particularly want to get into data engineering, um, I think building a portfolio, it would contain slightly different things, but it's still a useful sort of experience. Um, particularly when it comes to things like Git um, and GitHub, again, it's kind of one of those sort of essential skills for for data engineers. Yeah, and uh, another question, another follow-up question. Yeah, um, I was wondering. Um, I've been looking at the like the qualifications for uh, data scientists and data engineers. Uh, do do data scientists must have a higher qualification than data engineers because data scientists most of them are PhDs, maybe masters, double masters, and data engineers. That's uh, like you look at the entry level, that like entry level qualifications to work in a company. Is that true? It's true in some companies, um, but it's, I wouldn't say it was true in all companies. Um, so we, our companies sort of don't put any requirements on anyone to have a master's or PhD. Um, we are happy to take people for either data scientists or data engineering positions um, with sort of bachelor degrees. Um, a lot of people get into data science after having been a data analyst. So, you know, you might sort of start out as a data analyst and gain the same similar sets of skills you would have gained from doing a PhD, but sort of doing it in a work environment and then moving up to, to data science. Um, so I think there's kind of, there's a lot of different pathways into to data science. And in terms of sort of backgrounds and 
and what people study. You don't necessarily need to have studied maths or statistics or data science. Um, I think data scientists are, you know, we have a lot of sort of people who did sort of physics or economics or psychology. It's sort of that the idea that you like working with data is is usually enough of a technical background. Okay. Um, do we have any more um, questions for Nicola while we have her? Marty, don't you have anything uh, to say? Uh, no, I thought that this was a, a great presentation. And um, yeah, kind of thinking about things in the chat, um, you know, data telling a story, it's definitely um, in some ways up to the data scientists to decide what um, uh, what story to tell, you know, big data is really big. And so there's a lot of different stories that you could tell. And so it's a matter of choice um, uh, in some respects. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, Nicola. This was great. Thanks. Yusuf, your hand is up. Yes, I have a question about the, the credibility of, uh, of the portfolio. Because uh, nowadays everyone can uh, download a project and upload the portfolio. How, for example, an employee can detect the, the credibility of this uh, portfolio, for example? Yeah, um, it, it is always um, a possibility that if you upload code or a project publicly, that someone else copies it and says it was theirs. Um, there's a couple of ways to sort of roughly tell where projects came from. So when you make GitHub projects, you can create a fork, which is like creating a copy of the code, but GitHub keeps a record of what the original one was. So you can sort of see if someone else has a repository with the same thing and they've forked it from yours, um, you can sort of see where the original point was. Um, GitHub also lets you put licenses on your work. Um, so you can put code up publicly and say, you know, the, the, it's code that's public, but please don't reuse it. It, it might not stop someone who's very determined, um, but I think it, it's still a useful thing to add. Um, and if you are doing things like sort of posting it on Twitter or, or wherever, there's a date there. So you can see what date your code was created or uploaded. Um, and it's going to be bef a date that's before anyone else has uploaded it. So um, I think if anybody was worried that your work was copied or someone else had copied your work, they would sort of double check those those dates and things when you uh, added your work to GitHub. Okay, Yusuf, uh, do you have another question? Your hand is still up, or is it uh, from the previous one? We good? Okay. The Do previous we... one. Oh, okay. Do we have any other questions? Any comments for Nicola? Debo Hokawa, you have any questions? Any comments you want to give to Nicola? I have a question about the community. How, for example, me, for example, or others that uh, just touched with me can interact with each other and learn from each other and from people that has experience, like Nicola, for example. Yeah. Um, so generally, places like sort of Twitter and, and LinkedIn, people post their code and share it. Um, the other place that is a really nice sort of community is the R4DS Slack community. Um, I'll find a link for it in a second and post it in the chat. But um, essentially, it started out as a, a reading group for the R for Data Science book by Hadley Wickham. Um, and it has now, it's now a sort of Slack community with something like 10,000 R users in it. Um, and there's sort of, there's reading groups there. Um, so you can sort of uh, work through a particular uh, book if you're interested in learning a specific topic. Um, but there's also just sort of channels for chatting about R. 
um, or asking questions if you're stuck with something. And it means you have, you know, you have access to people who are very experienced in the art community. Um, and it's very, it's also very beginner friendly. Um, so there's sort of, uh, you can ask any sort of art related questions in there. And it's a nice kind of place to chat about art. Um, I will find a link for that in a, in a second. Oh, yes. Nicole. Nicole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. I was asking the same question. Like, um, do you have a community for Python? Because uh, I'm, I'm proficient in that. So, can you send a link if you're a part of it? Uh, yeah, um, I'm not super aware of sort of Python communities. There are sort of uh, uh, Py data events and sort of there's a Py ladies community as well who do sort of similar things too. Um, our ladies. Um, there is a sort of Python channel within uh, the R for DS Slack as well. So if you are familiar with R and Python, again, it's kind of a nice place to to ask questions. Okay, I think we are done with all the questions. If there aren't any more questions, any comments, suggestions, I think we're done with the presentation. Thank you, Nicola, so much for taking time from your busy schedule. My goodness, Marty's a big fan of yours. I'm also a big fan of yours. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see you at the next meetup, wherever you are, because we follow you and all your social media pages. And um, I'm going to end the recording. And before, I just want everyone's um, time, like five minutes, because we're going to go through some announcements that are out there in the data science world. So I'm going to end it and thank you everyone for coming and yeah, we'll see you next time. For those of us who have, who just joined us, who came late, you can follow um, us on our social media pages on Twitter, LinkedIn. And if you're not on Twitter, you can follow us on Facebook and you can get the recording on our YouTube channel. So yeah, see you next time. Bye-bye.